I'm so glad to be here with you today, and I'm excited about what God is going to do. I got a great message in store, um, and uh, right now I just want to ask you to put aside distractions, get ready to focus. Uh, this one is one you're going to need to focus on. It's going to be a good message, but you're going to need to focus. And uh, we are in our Hey God series, and this series is all about asking God a question, right? So like, hey God, for example, how do we accomplish racial reconciliation? That's what we talked about last week, and uh, this week we've got a cool one. But before we get into that, I want to say welcome to those of you watching online. Thank you so much for joining us. We love you. We miss you. And uh, if you're healthy and young enough, I would really love to invite you to come make a reservation and join us in person. We've absolutely loved our experiences here, and uh, they're awesome. They're safe. Um, we're lifting some of the social distancing guidelines, which is really cool. This week, masks, instead of being strongly, strongly, strongly recommended, but we don't demand it because we're not fascists, now we're saying masks optional, but recommended while singing. And uh, that's what we're doing. I know a lot of you are behind that. It does seem like the church is the last place in DeMont and Wheatfield that continues to do social distancing, but we do value your safety, and uh, we do have a plan to continue to lift restrictions. Next week, Father's Day, coffee's back. We're going to serve you coffee, and that's amazing. I'm super excited about that. I love caffeine juice. It's super good. But uh, to our in-house family, I want to say thanks for coming in person. We love you guys, and I think this is part of our faith played out. And uh, to fellowship together, to remind ourselves of God's promises. But one of the things I didn't realize during the shutdown is how much this gathering centers me during the week and increases my compassion for people. And I think this is a big deal. It's a big lesson for me. I think part of the reason that we've seen people, including Christians in America, become so polarized about current issues is because we've stopped gathering. And not just since COVID, but also in general. Because when you see people, you just get compassion for them. You know, when you're anonymous online, it's easy to lash out. But when you know them, it changes things. And uh, when I see your face every week, it makes it easier for me to have compassion for them. I mean, that's just the way that it works. You know, for example... If I was driving in Valpo or Merrillville and I had a road rage incident, and I wouldn't do this, but let's say I gave someone the finger. I wouldn't do that again. But let's say I did that. Um, honestly, it wouldn't be that big a deal because you don't see anyone there. You know what I mean? Like on a, on a spiritual level, it's not good. But on a like actual community level, it's like, well, don't know them, whatever. You know, and you just, you treat people worse when you don't know them. But in this town, DeMott, Wheatfield, like you can't do that because it's like, oh my goodness, I know you. You know what I mean? Like, oh no, I can't rage, right? Because we have relationships with people. And that's what I love about this community. That's what I love about this church is it's one of the last places on earth where different people from different backgrounds and different cultures and different races and different political affiliations come together to celebrate what we have in common instead of fight about what's different. I love that about the church. And uh, you know, this last week, several of you from many different perspectives had real meaningful conversations conversations with each other and me, and I just feel like we accomplished meaningful reconciliation, bridge building, and conversation as a church, and I don't want to lose that. That's why gathering in person, I think, is so important. I know I talked with so many of you um, who have been born here, raised here in this church. You've been here for 70 plus years, which I think is really cool, and your grandkids and great-grandkids are here. And that's actually really special. To you, it might not be, but like nationally, that is unheard of. And, uh, you know, most of the places I've lived, being elderly is a pretty lonely thing. But here in this community, I've just noticed that elderly people have rich, meaningful experiences and lives with rich tapestry of community. It's because you understand compassion. It's because you understand empathy and compromise. And uh, as we see a country that's divided racially and politically, I have been uniquely proud of this church for being compassionate, welcoming, diplomatic, understanding, and empathetic. You know, I've lived a lot of places, and I can say that um, generally I have not felt safe around police forces. I've had some bad experiences in my life, and I do think nationally there are some police departments that may need reform. Um, but I'm so thankful for Jasper County Sheriff's Department and DeMott and Wheatfield Police. Like, in the dozens of times we've had encounters as a church, and I have um, had to call the police, like, I'm just so thankful, so thankful that for the last six years, 100% of my experiences have been exemplary, amazing. And as I look at the national story, I mean, the killing of George Floyd by Derek Chauvin is heartbreaking and, and, and just awful, but it reminds me of why I'm thankful for the personable, well-trained, well-selected police and sheriff's department that we have here. And you know, um, I don't want to be a generalizer. I think that's the problem with racism is we have an experience in one place and we generalize that to everybody. And I just want you to know, to our departments here, we love you, we're thankful for you, you're excellent at your job, and we're grateful for you. Um, if you are new here, I want you to know this is a place of growth 
and love. And you're gonna be challenged and you're going to be stretched. If you wanna point the finger at other people and be surrounded by an echo chamber of people who say the same things and think the same things and believe the same things, it probably isn't the place for you. But if you wanna be loved and challenged and stretched and grown in a lifelong faithful community that cares for each other, that understands each other, that challenges one another, if you wanna level up and grow a little bit each year rather than living the same year on repeat, this is the place for you. No matter what you believe, we say no one's perfect and everyone's welcome. And I love this community. As I said, we're in this series called Hey God. And specifically this week, we're asking this question, Hey God, are we living in the end times? And uh, this is a question I get asked a lot, but especially now I've been asked this question all the time. And it's because this has been a crazy year. 2020 was supposed to be amazing. Like for the last, I don't know, 15 years, everybody's saying, when we get to the year 2020, here's what our vision is. And it's a funny like ophthalmologist pun that everybody loved. I'm sick of it, glad we're through it. But 2020 was supposed to be amazing and it's not. For the last five years, news headlines have been terrible. You know, unprecedented this, unbelievable, unacceptable, all this stuff, right? And you know what's interesting is the last five years have actually been really good for our nation. I think in general, I mean, there have been bad things that happened, but economically, I mean, it's been great. But this last year has been rough. And it's kind of hard because I feel like it's the boy who cried wolf with the news. You know what I mean? It's going to be terrible. It's going to be terrible. When it's actually terrible, it's almost like, oh, but it is bad. I mean, the impeachment, like no matter what side of that you're on, that was a really bad way to start the year. And then COVID and then the recession and then the shutdown and then murder hornets came. It's like murder hornets. Oh my goodness. What do I do? And then racism and brutality. And it's hard. I just, I don't know about you, but I feel emotionally exhausted. I remember in high school, I would run cross country, right? And I don't know why I did it, didn't enjoy it, but I did it anyway. Um, But we would run 5Ks, our races were 5K, 3.1 miles. And I always remember running the race and my lungs would be burning. I would be so exhausted. My legs were on fire and I felt like I was all about to burst and I'd be looking for the mile marker. You know what I mean? I'd be looking for this mile marker, trying to figure out how far am I? In my mind, I'd be like, we gotta be like three miles into this. Okay, we're probably almost done. And then I'd see 1.5 and I'd be like, ah! We're not even halfway. This is terrible. And I just remember wanting to quit. Wanting to quit and walk off the track. And I think that's how a lot of us feel right now. When it comes to life, when it comes to stress, when it comes to just caring, it's like, I don't even, God, how much longer? Are you like gonna come back? I mean, are you paying attention right here? How much longer? I just wanna explode sometimes. I just can't deal with all the stuff that keeps happening. If you're new to church, if you're new to faith, Christians believe that the world will end when Jesus returns. And there are some words in the Bible that kind of give some descriptions of what that time's going to feel like. And so Christians have made a pastime out of predicting, like, are we in the end times? That's what I want to talk about today. But I think the bigger question isn't, are we living in the end times? I think the bigger question is, how do Christians live in wild and crazy times? Because Christians have said a lot of things are the end times that weren't the end times. The good news is Jesus actually speaks specifically to this issue in Matthew chapter 24. He makes four points on what to do when it feels like the world is ending. And I think that's really relevant to us today. And I'm going to share them with you. We're going to go through Jesus's message verse by verse, expository. He's preaching the message today, not really me. But uh, he uses the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of God's temple there to start the conversation about what to do when it feels like the end. And the destruction of the temple would be a huge deal. I cannot overstate to a Jewish person from antiquity what a big deal the temple in Jerusalem was. The idea of the city falling and the temple being destroyed was the worst thing that could possibly happen ever. Far worse than America being destroyed. It was literally the worst occurrence that you could hear of as a Jewish person. It's worse than your spouse dying, worse than your kids dying. It was the worst, worst, worst thing imaginable. To the Jewish mind at that time, the temple being destroyed would be the end of their religion, the end of God, the end of their race. It would be the end of everything. It was literally the worst news that you could hear. And Jesus brings up the worst possible event to help his disciples process how do we act when the end is coming. Our key question is, hey God, are we living in the end times? But I think a better question is, how do I act when it feels like the end times or when it feels like my world is ending? Let's jump into Matthew 24, verse one. As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. But he responded, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of the other. It's a very specific description. 
The disciples are walking through the greatest structure on earth. I mean, right now in the world, the greatest structure on earth is probably the Burj Khalifa. It's the tallest building. It's in Dubai. Um, but like the temple in Jerusalem made this thing look silly in the eyes of antiquity. I mean, the temple in Jerusalem was so much more incredible. I mean, even this rendering of it, like a person would be like an ant in there. I mean, this thing was huge and amazing. And the boys are seeing it. The disciples are mostly teenagers. And you know how teenagers are. They're like, oh man, it was just mind blowing. I saw this and it was like the best night ever and everything is amazing because, you know, they're all firsts. And Jesus sees these boys like sons and he knows their whole society is rooted in this building. And he also knows he needs to prepare them because he knows that the building is going to be destroyed. So he starts this conversation with them because he wants to prepare them to interact with times that feel like the end. In verse 3, it says, Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, which overlooks the temple. Um, you know, it's a mountain that overlooks the temple, so they're all looking at it. And his disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will this happen? What signal, what sign will signal the end of the world? Now, you have to understand, they think they're asking him one question. Uh, when will the, but really, they're asking two questions. When will this happen? And what sign will we see for the end of the world? They think they're asking one, but really two. And, and here's the reason. Here's the reason. Um, they ask this because in their mind, the destruction of the temple could mean nothing other than the end of the world. Um, in their mind, it's one question. But in reality, it's two different events. Because we know that the temple was destroyed in AD 70, just 38 years after they're having this discussion, and the world has not ended. So the disciples are confused by Jesus' answer, though, because they think it's one question. Now, Jesus answers both questions, and some people who are smarter than me have some different thoughts about this, but I think I'm right, even though they might be smarter, I'm right, okay? Um, I think Jesus is answering both questions separately. And I don't have the time to go through the full expanse of Matthew 25. It's actually an amazing chapter in the book of Matthew, um, but it's split into three sections. Verses 4 through 14 talk about how to act when we feel like the world is ending, but it's not the end yet. Verses 15 through 35 specifically talk about the fall of Jerusalem, which was part one of the question the disciples asked. And then um, part two is answered in 36 through 51. This is what the signs of the end of, world, of the world are going to look like. I wish I could unpack it all for you, but what I really want to do is zoom in on verses 4 through 14 and talk about how do we act when it feels like the world is going to end. It says, Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I'm the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you'll hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. And that's a good word. That's Jesus' first point to us today, don't panic. And I think some of us just need to let that sink in for a moment. Like, just let that, you know, everybody's kind of worrying, just don't panic, don't panic, stop, stop for a moment and just let that sink in. I think so many of us, when we panic, what do you do when you panic? Um, you stop what you're doing, and you go address a more immediate issue. You decide whether to fight or flight. And as Christians, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, tells us when things seem crazy, it's not really the end of the world. So don't panic. Don't stop focusing on spreading the gospel of Jesus. It's probably not the end of the world. And Christians, I think, need to hear this because we spend so much time speculating on, is this the end of the world? Is this the end of the world? Jesus is like, stop, stop, don't worry about that. No matter what, all you gotta do is spread the gospel of Jesus and live the Great Commission. I had a friend who legitimately thought the year 2000 would be the end of the world. They literally stocked up their basement on non-perishables. They built a little bunker. They bought a bunch of Remington 223 full metal jacket ammunition. They stopped going to church. They stopped sharing their faith. They panicked. And that right there, I mean, what a waste. That's tragic. What a waste of life. I mean, even if it was going to be the end, I would like to spend my very last days living out the Great Commission as Jesus commanded us. Jesus goes on, he says, yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all this is only the first of birth pains with more to come. Christians, Jesus wants you to know that there's more to come. This isn't the end of the world. So often we panic and we're like, oh, there's wars and threats of wars and all this stuff is happening and this is unprecedented and this is murder hornets and this has never happened and what are we going to do? And bad stuff happens in the world until Jesus returns. And he says, it's going to feel like the end. Every generation is going to say, the Great Depression is the end of the world. World War I is the end of the world. World War II is the end of the world. He says, don't quit the race before it's done. And I know a lot of us feel like we're running and we're like, I'm so tired, my legs want to explode, I can't take it anymore. Come, Lord Jesus, return. And he's like, listen, you can yearn for my, for, for my return, but don't stop the race. You need to keep running. Anytime there's an issue that takes us away from sharing Jesus as the only hope for spiritual justice and the only hope for the world, I get a little bit concerned. Right relationship with God is the one thing that fixes a broken world, fixes everything else. 
And if we get more passionate about re-electing or de-electing the president, whatever it is for you, if you're more passionate about social justice or racial justice or legal justice, if you're more passionate about a war, an earthquake, a pastor, a sign, a prophecy, than you are about the message of Jesus Christ, crucified for our sins, spread to the nations of the earth, then you're stopping the primary work that God has given us. You're panicking, and he says don't panic, and ultimately, you're living in idolatry. Because none of those things that I listed will save the world. Only Jesus, crucified for our sins, risen from the grave, redeems us. And I'm not saying that those things don't matter. I'm not saying that as a Christian, I can't be engaged in those things. I am engaged in many of those things. I just think that the number one priority in my life needs to be Jesus Christ. I think the best way to bring about reform and reconciliation to a broken world is the gospel of Jesus by building the kingdom of God through the message of Jesus driven deep into all of our hearts, to every tongue, tribe, and nation. The result of God in our life is loving one another. And throughout history, this is proven true. I mean, it is Jesus in his teaching that brought dignity to all human life and emancipated and ended slavery in the Roman Empire. It is Jesus in his teaching that brought the world the long peace. It is Jesus in his teaching that would heal the brokenness of the world today. Matthew 24, verse 9. Jesus goes on, he says, you're going to be arrested, persecuted, and killed. And you'll be hated all over the world because you are my followers. Jesus gives us this prophecy about what it's going to be like to follow him. And I don't want to minimize the pain and hurt that specific minority communities and black community in our country is facing right now. But I want you to hear this. Christians by a long shot, and this isn't covered in the news. This isn't covered in the news at all. But Christians by a long shot are the most discriminated against, most martyred, most innocently killed group of people, not just historically, but globally today as a matter of statistical fact. Jesus' prophecy was right. And following Jesus isn't easy. He was right. I mean, not just the persecution we face, but his plan for human sexuality and gender, to his plan for loving people who look different, to his plan for forgiveness and loving our enemies. I mean, I preached a message last week that was really hard for us to hear, right? The idea that we need to forgive people who are enemies, who hurt us. It's not easy, but it's worth it. And it makes your life better, and it makes the world better. I want to challenge you to not quit the race before it's done. And it might hurt, and it might burn, and some of you are running this race just like me in cross country in high school. It's like, I just want to quit. I'm just so tired, God. How much more? How much more? He says, you keep running. I want you to know if you're not dead, God's not done with you yet. Jesus goes on to say, and this is harsh, but many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. People are shocked a lot when Christians fight with each other. And, uh, you know, I hear people saying, you know, the Protestant church is so fractured and denominational split and there's embarrassment and, we're spo- and we are supposed to love one another. But when I see the church split, when I see church arguing, it's not like, oh man, God's word isn't true. It's a confirmation of what God told us would already happen. A denomination splitting doesn't mean God's word is untrue. It means Jesus saw what was coming and he said in the midst of it, you have a call to preach the gospel. Don't get sidetracked on fighting for this or fighting for that or talking about which side we butter the toast upon or debating this deal or jot or tittle or that or whatever. He says, you spread the gospel. That's your call as a Christian. Don't stop running the race. I think that's so important. He goes on in verse 11. He says, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. Now, there's two responses of, of sin that are being talked about. First off, false prophets, and secondly, the love of many will grow cold. But, but before we get into that, I want to talk about sin, okay? It talks about sin being rampant everywhere. I hear people all the time say, oh, pastor, the world is just such a sinful place. It's so much more sinful than when I was a kid. It's so sinful. The world is just, it's terrible. What are we getting? It's terrible. And listen, the world has always been sinful. If you study history, if you read about the practices of the Roman Empire, if you read about the practices of the Holy Roman Empire, if you read about the practices of the Greeks, oh my goodness, terrible, 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 terrible. Every generation struggles with sin. I would say some generations struggle with a different kind of sin. And the sin that you were used to in one generation, you just don't notice it right? I would say that a previous generation was generally okay with racism, right? A new generation looks at that and said, that's terrible. An old generation was not okay with sexual sin. A new generation is like, ah, whatever, it's fine, right? It's just a different sin. So to us, it looks terrible. Jesus says, look, every generation, sin is going to be rampant. People sin. We live in a fallen world. And we'll react in one of two ways. Number one, we'll believe false prophets and say, ah, sin's not a big deal, right? Or number two, the love in our hearts will grow cold, And this is a big deal. I've talked about the first one. I've talked about false prophets a lot. But what I want to address is Jesus' point here, the love of many growing cold. And I just want to tell you, when it feels like the end of the world, don't let your love grow cold. I think this is what we see happening right now. I see a lot of Christians almost taking a pharisaical approach, like, well, you're just an evil person, and you're just terrible, and that's it. You know, whatever. 
We've had a, a decade of the new cycle desensitizing us to sin and human suffering. And that's what sin ultimately brings, by the way, human suffering. Sin wants to blame others for its own mistakes. Sin wants to victimize people by making them feel like powerless victims. That's what sin does. It says, well, it's not your fault. It's not your fault, so you can't do anything. And that's what it's not your fault does, right? It, it disenfranchises you. It removes your power, removes your ability to take action. Whenever somebody did something hurtful to me as a kid, my parents always said, don't think about their role. What is your role in this? You need to own it. I want you to pretend like it's all your fault, and I want you to focus on what you can focus on. Confession and repentance, for me, always brought empowerment and freedom. And that's why God calls us to it. He doesn't want you to feel like a victim. He wants you to feel empowered and he wants you to feel free. This is why God calls us to confession and repentance. I see a world where our hearts are growing cold. Christians are just walking off the track saying, well, whatever, I'm done. I don't care about dealing with these other people. They just keep hurting me and whatever. And listen, this isn't the end of the race yet. God didn't tell you you could stop yet. I was so disturbed, so disturbed, deeply and emotionally by the video of George Floyd's murder. I saw the short version, and then I tried to watch the long version, but I couldn't get, couldn't get through all eight and a half minutes of it. If your heart is at a place where it doesn't really care, then your heart is growing cold. And look, agreeing or disagreeing about what the solution is to the problem is one thing. I'm not saying you can't engage in, in whatever about that, but fundamentally, if we're not weeping with those who weep, if we're not compassionate for people who are weeping and hurting, our heart is growing cold. And I think that I am guilty of this in a lot of different capacities. I mean, my heart is growing cold on my newsfeed. How easy is it for me to just label someone? Oh, well, that person's a this. That person does these things. That person, I'm not even gonna, you know what I mean? Like, I don't care if they unfriend me. I mean, they just make that post and whatever. And I'm just knocking and whatever. And I become jaded to unprecedented issues and my love. How easy is it for my love to grow cold? And Jesus says, look, when things are crazy in the world, when you feel like it might be the end, it's gonna be easy to let your love grow cold. Don't do it. And I think this is the problem with becoming a battle-hardened Christian. Our hearts grow hard and our love grows cold. This is literally the primary sign of our salvation, by the way, loving one another, but our love grows cold. Jesus says, if you think the world is ending, don't panic. There's gonna be more to come. Don't let your love grow cold. I don't think Jesus is coming back this week, this month, this year or even the next thousand years. I could be wrong. If I am, great. But Jesus warned his disciples, you're gonna think it's the end of the world over and over and over again. You're gonna hear about wars. Christians are gonna be persecuted. There's gonna be crazy stuff that's happening. And in the midst of a broken world, in the midst of a broken world, don't panic. There's more to come. Don't let your love grow cold. You keep preaching the gospel. And then I love his, his last little thought here. He goes, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. His final point to us, is don't give up. Don't give up. I love that part right here. The one who endures the end, don't stop loving, don't stop caring, don't stop bridge building, don't stop making an effort for empathy and understanding. I think we have a society that has forgotten the long game. If we get uncomfortable, we just quit. If the friendship isn't right, we just quit. We ghost them. If the job is one issue we don't like, one little part we don't like, we just quit. It's not fulfilling. I'm not called to it. It wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't what I thought of. I'm just going to quit. If a marriage is hard, what do we do? We just quit. We just quit. If faith gets hard, we just quit. If school gets hard, we just quit. We call ourselves a victim. Oh, you know, I mean, it's just hard because of my background and because of the system. And it's just, you know, it's not my fault that this happened. We just quit. We just quit. That's a temptation. And Jesus looks at us in the midst of it. And he says, you got to run the race. I have a calling on your life. I have greatness planned for you, but you can't quit. You got to endure to the end. And here's the problem. Here's the problem. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. Okay? God's grace is given to us for our sins. We ask Jesus to forgive us and lead us, and we receive that by faith, by faith. And I think lots of people believe in Jesus, right? It's pretty easy to believe in Jesus. Um, you know, obviously, we're not superstitious. We know he fulfilled these crazy prophecies that came true, and you know, that's why I'm not an atheist. I mean, specifically because of this passage is one of the many reasons I chose to follow Jesus, because I can't deny facts. It's easy to believe in Jesus. I think faith is easy, but the action of faith called faithfulness, that's a lot harder. And that's what this generation struggles with. That's what this world struggles with. It's easy in a crazy society to just say, well, I'm not gonna be faithful to this. I'm just gonna run away. I'm just gonna shut down. I'm just gonna panic. In a crazy society, though, we don't panic. God tells us there's more to come. Don't let your love grow cold and endure to the end. Be faithful. I wanna speak to people who are on the brink of quitting. You're just about 
to start unfriending and blocking people. You're just about to build an echo chamber of people who only agree with you. You're about to go home and talk with your family who all hold the same opinions and stoke the fires of hatred in your life. And everybody is like, well, that was just out of touch. That was just tone deaf. He is so out of touch. I mean, what do you mean? He's just, with the stuff produce itself? He's just a, a racist. They're just a bigot. We get to this place where we label people all these different things, right? And it's just so easy to shut down and to stop loving and to let our hearts grow cold. We stop caring about a whole group of people we disagree with. We say, we make this nasty post that burns stuff to the ground and burns bridges saying like, I'm gonna make this horrible meme that minimizes your perspective and makes you look stupid and say, go ahead and unfriend me. Go ahead and block me. That's what we do. That's not gonna fix the world. The world has no shortage of bridge burners. The world has no shortage of people who say, well, if you disagree with me, I'm gonna go in my echo chamber and listen to everybody else who agrees with me. There's no shortage of that. We have a shortage of winsome, captivating listeners who are selfless, who lay down their life and they build a bridge and they show people the love of God and they bring people into that grace. That's the call of Christians and that's what we need. Faith in God means faithfulness in showing his love to people made in his image, even if they feel like an enemy. I love how he sums it up here, right? He makes his, his four points. Don't panic. There's more to come. Don't let your love grow cold and don't give up. And then he goes into this last part here. And the good news, when all four of those things will be done, and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all the nations will hear it. And then the end will come. And then Jesus returns. And then God makes all things new and all things right. It's heaven on earth. And the brokenness we yearn so badly to see be fixed is fixed. But he does it through us. He does it through his people. It is through the faithfulness of the church of Jesus that the brokenness in the world is restored. You want to know why I'm passionate about this? You want to know why I think church matters? You want to know why I think being a part of this community is so important? Because the brokenness we see in the world is resolved through these people. Understanding that God has a great call in your life that repairs the world. I've had a lot of people come speak to me who disagree with me about a lot of different things as a pastor. It's one of the privileges of my job. And I call it a privilege because I mean it. It's their improvement opportunities that I get all the time, all the time. You know, you think about this. This is a, this is a big church. I bet you there's probably 3,000 people who would say, this church is my church home. We don't have that attendance on the weekend. But generally, like people who say, oh yeah, first church is my church, right? And if each one of those people visits me, I don't know, once every two years, once every three years, like that's a lot of conversations that I have on the daily with people who disagree. What I love about this job is I always have improvement opportunities and through those conversations, I get to build a bridge with somebody. I get to learn from their perspective and then I get to show them who Jesus is. I think it's such a blessing. I've grown as a person so, so much because of that. But here's a temptation. Here's a temptation to run away, to shut down and to let my love grow cold. The, the temptation is to flip chips and get angry and just quit, isn't it? I'm just gonna shut you out of my life. I don't need to talk to people and they don't understand. And just in a moment of honesty, this has been a really hard season for all of us, but um, this has been a really hard season for me personally. It's been a really hard season. The mantle that I carry, we all have our, our different burdens to bear, but um, th these last few months have been hard on me. And uh, I love God so much, but I've been fantasizing a lot about just shutting down. I've been fantasizing a lot about letting my specific passions about earthly issues supersede heavenly ones. I mean, I want to weigh in specifically. I want to let some people know that this is the right thing and here's what I really think and here's what I think and wait, 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 stop, 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 right? That's idolatry. My passion about this earthly thing, about this political thing happening isn't going to supersede the grace of Jesus. It's not going to repair the world. A political party isn't the answer. But sometimes I just want to just, I want very much to not care about people that I can't please. And there's people in my life feel like I can't please them, but I'm called to them nevertheless. I've been dreaming about just not caring anymore. I want to so badly just focus on myself and my passions. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus knew. He knew the disciples would feel this way. He knew the pain that they would feel. And he also knew the pain that we would feel today. And I think it's incredible how relevant this passage is. That 2,000 years ago, Jesus spoke these words, not just to them, but to us, but to us, but to us today. And his words echo in our minds. I want to read it to you one more time. And I want you to listen to it as I read it. Jesus says, but the one who endures to the end, the one who endures to the end will be saved and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all the nations will hear it. And then, and then, and then the end will come. I want that to be us. I want that to be our church. I want us to endure to the end. I want us to finish the race. I want the good news about the kingdom to be preached to the whole world so that the nations will hear it through us. 
Lord, may it be us. Lord, use us. This is not the end of our story, but we can't panic. And I won't lie to you, there may be more. But don't let your love grow cold and endure to the end. Jesus is worth it. His promises are real and his love endures. This whole message, this whole situation, a lot of times reminds me of Martin Luther King Jr. He was assassinated on April 4th, 1968. On April 3rd, 1968, the night before he died, he, um, he had received death threats and he gave a speech that was designed to prepare the world to continue his cause in the event that he might be killed. I believe they're some of the finest words ever spoken and recorded in the modern era. And to this day, when I read the words from this particular speech, it pierces my heart. He was considered during his day by many to be a writer and a problem, despite his stand for equality, love, reconciliation, the gospel, the message of Jesus, and peaceful protest. And I wanna read some of the things that he said to you today, and I just want you to hear this. The final words in his speech, these are his final recorded public words. He said, we've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't really matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would love to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just wanna do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. And I may not get there with you, but I know, I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. I'm so happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not worried about any man. For mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. These are the last words recorded of Martin Luther King Jr. These are the words of a man who was facing his imminent death, who knew he would probably be killed in the next couple of days, who knew society was still not reconciled. And in the midst of the fear, in the midst of all the things that would make a normal person say, this is the end. He did not panic. He did not stop God's work of reconciliation on earth. He knew there was more to come. He knew there was more suffering and more hardship to come, but his love did not grow cold. He did not give up. He finished the race, he endured to the end. And Christians, this is our call. His mantle is our mantle. And this is our time. We have a world that needs Jesus. We have a world whose heart is growing cold, brimming with hatred and anger and polarization. And I want you to hear this, don't let your hearts grow cold. Jesus told us his word will reign. His love endures forever. And I wanna close with these words. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't really matter to me now because I've received the grace of Jesus, because I've been to the mountaintop. We've seen the promises of God, and I may not get there with you, but we as a people, as a movement, as a church, as a faith, we'll get to the promised land. And I'm not fearing anybody. I'm not fearing any man. I'm not fearing pandemic. I'm not fearing murder hornets. I'm not fearing the government. I'm not fearing hatred. I'm not fearing death. I'm not fearing racism. For my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And He wins. And He reigns. And He conquers. And we will not panic. And we will be faithful in all things. makes me want to act up a whole bunch more. I want to shout and sing and worship our God. He wins and he reigns. He put death to death and brought life to us. But listen, we could do that all day and we can't do that. We can do that in our cars. We can do that other places. Right now, I want to challenge you though, because this message isn't meant to give us energy. This message is to 
help us take action. So I got some challenges for you. I got some questions I want you to discuss. It's right here. And uh, I wrote four of them down. They're challenges for you to discuss at home. Number one, are you living out the primary work that God has given to you? I think this is such a big question for us to really sit down as a family and say, are, are we doing this as a family? I mean, are we living out the Great Commission? Do people far from God know about Jesus because of our effort, because of our work, because of our giving, because of our lives, because of our relationships? Kristen and I continually have this discussion. Like this is a question that has been so healthy for us as a family to ask because it's easy to get sidetracked on things that don't matter. Right? It's easy for me to sit down and be like, oh, I want to give my kids a good life. Oh, I want them to love each other and enjoy. And that's all good. That's all good. That's, that's important. But it doesn't supersede this. Number two, why does it matter to do God's work? I think this is an important discussion too. I mean, obviously I want to store up treasure in heaven, and, but I want you to actually talk about it with your families. I want you to have a legitimate discussion with your kids and with yourselves. Why is this important? Number three, how does following Jesus bring healing to relationships on earth? And how has it healed your relationships? Man, when you sit down and talk about the way that God has transformed us, the way that God has healed us, it's such a healthy thing. It's such a moving thing for me because when I think about God's faithfulness in the past, it encourages me in the present to continue to give his love, believing that he's gonna lead me to a great future. And then finally, are you building bridges or burning them with your life, with your rhetoric, with relationships, and with your posts? I think this is a really, really big deal. It's easy to make a post about your opinion. It's hard to make a post that shows people what God's love is. It's easy to just say what you think, but it's hard to build a relationship with somebody who's different and to show them who Jesus is and to lead them into that fold. Yet that's the call of God on our life. And I want fathers and mothers to have a legit discussion with your family, with your kids, help them see where you're at and maybe confess to yourself where you're at. There might be some changes we need to make today. I wanna challenge you to do that. I'm so glad you guys tuned in. Um, in, in, in just a second here, um, we're gonna talk about Father's Day. And uh, if you haven't signed up for next week's services, please do that. Like, please go online, it really helps. Next week is Father's Day. I'm bringing a message to dads. Uh, listen, ladies, do you want better husbands, okay? Do you want husbands who love God more? Do you want a husband who loves you more and is emotionally open and ready to engage with you and the kids? Well, get them to church next week, okay? It's gonna be good. Make reservations, it's good. It's gonna be awesome. I can't wait to preach that message, but, 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 but. Every year, I do a Father's Day video where I do some hooting and hollering. And uh, this year is no different. I do it at the end of our services. I'm gonna do it right here. And I want you guys to get ready for this, but I gotta get myself in the mood, okay? So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna talk about what Father's Day is gonna be. We were gonna have a car smash, but we can't do that because of COVID, but we got a different plan, okay? You guys ready? Everybody ready? Here we go. Hey dads, are you a man? Do you like doing man things? Do you like earning brownie points while doing things you love? Then take your kids to the first church, Father's Day Fishing Tournament. It's not just any old fishing tournament. It's a Father's Day Nitro Fishing Tournament. For 30 minutes after the 11:15 service, we're having a picnic and fishing tournament with your kids. And we're not just catching any fish, we're catching tiger fish. That's called striper. They have stripes on them, but they look like tigers. I can't wait. I don't know how to fish, but I'm gonna show my kids what's up. Hands in, team up three, Father's Day fishing tournament next week. One, two, three, team.